You are listening to Investing Matters, brought to you in association with London South East. This is the show that provides informative, educational and entertaining content from the world of investing. We do not give advice, so please do your own research. Hello and welcome to the Investing Matters podcast. My name is Peter Higgins and today I have the huge privilege of speaking with Tim Rogers, the former CEO of ABD Dynamics. He's worked over the past several decades with lots of different companies, NASDAQ listed companies, AIM listed companies, SMEs, private equity, you name it, Tim's involved in it. And he's a highly sought after individual uh, with regards to evaluating the, the value, the prospects and opportunities regarding lots of different companies in lots of different sectors. So we're, we're usually privileged to have Tim to give us a little bit of his time today. So thank you ever so much, Tim. So how are you doing today, Tim? I'm fine, considering that apparently I'm several decades old. No, in business, several decades. That's what I'm saying. Oh, you know, you're very experienced, too, mate, which is why we're speaking today. So, age, then. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I want to start, if I may, because obviously with, with the, the notes that I've got on you, you uh, grew up rural Oxfordshire. No surprise, you know, got involved in agri- agricultural studies as such, but eventually ended up at Exxon Mobil. That's a How massive that leap. Yeah. So yeah. You, te- do you want to tell us a little bit about that to start with? So we get a little bit of your transition and growth? Yeah, I, it was, um, you know, you sometimes look back and thinking, where were the turning points in your life? And the first one was... Uh, sitting up to my uh, armpits in, in Calmuck thinking agriculture is not really my scene. And um, I noticed that the local farmers guarded their daughters with, uh, with, with great kind of proprietary, so there's no way in there either. And um, <laughs> it just so happened that down the road was a, a research centre run by the Exxon Corporation. In the middle of Oxfordshire, there was this, and it was astonishing that the difference between, you know, what I had seen and what uh, Exxon, Exxon um, if you remember, they had managed to crash one of their tankers into the uh, into the reef outside of um, Murdo Sound, and we were all called to arms. Basically, anyone able-bodied working for Exxon had to get to Heathrow. And uh, three days later, I found myself in a hazmat suit, um, steam cleaning seals and um, things off the bay. And at that point, I had a chance to actually move inside the Exxon organisation and. You know, in the 80s, it was very forward thinking. They, they, were, they were working on total quality management. Uh, they, they looked to raise the potential of people working in, in the company. They'd already put me on an engineering course. So I was actually restudying for engineering. And I guess it was about then that I realized that I was never going to be the best engineer in the world or, or the greatest scientist, but I was quite a good generalist. I was able to sort of join the dots between the technology that we're working on and the commercial opportunity. And at that point, Exxon moved me more towards the technical support and the marketing. And then I got a taste for the sales and the international travel and uh, never really looked back and was able for the last uh, 30 years to be able to travel around the world and see how, um, just how other cultures managed and survived, seeing the best and worst of humankind sometimes. And it was very difficult sometimes coming back, having spent three months in Africa, um, coming back to the UK and you know finding people whinging about the fact that their microwave wasn't working and it just got me thinking about okay you, you've only got kind of one life on this earth you know we've had the privilege of being born into a, uh, a democratic and free country such as it is and uh, we should make the most of it and that's when I really knuckled down and started thinking about what I wanted to do in my life and where I wanted to go. I think that's pretty pretty awesome what you've said there. I think there is a, a huge element of of privilege in in the, in in the Western world, and then we do moan and grope and gripe about a, a lots of different things. Um, so it is important, and I know that you do quite a lot uh, with regards to to giving back as well, which is why we're speaking because you've got a, a, a huge philanthropic side, and we might speak about that later on as well. But okay. I want to go back a little bit because obviously you you studied agriculture whilst you were at um, Exxon Mobil. You obviously studied all the engineering aspects and you went to, again, um, Oxford Brooks, if I, if, is that correct? Well, yeah, yeah. it was called. It was called so the once Oxford again, Brooks. you're mixing with the privileged and the wealthy and the, the very, very educated. No, no, not actually. How was that an experience for you? Well, 
Oxford Brooks uh, is the former Polytechnic University of Oxford. Yeah. And um, it was interesting. I actually got my HNC from Oxford Polytechnic. Uh, but right. actually what happened was that they very quickly, when they became a university, sent me a new certificate 20 years later with the word Oxford Brooks on it. <laughs> So I always say I studied Brilliant. at Oxford, but I always qualify it with it was at the University of Oxford. But it is it is a rather they do have an awesome engineering reputation. And yes, um, they do. Yeah, and it was very uh I was very lucky to have done that. Um in fact it was the other way around, really. I started mixing with uh, apprentices from from the British Leyland works down the road. Uh, and that really gave me a, a view about um, you know, it was you, there's no shortcut for graft and work okay that's 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 the first thing but there is there is um a question of sort of working clever and that's something i saw quite quickly that you could really um you could really make a difference if you were a working hard but b working in the right way and there's so many people who are working really really you know difficult long hard jobs and you're thinking why why are you doing that and they just felt fixed by convention to continue to do what they always did and I, I didn't find that kind of problem, you know, having already switched careers at the age of 21 from agriculture to engineering, I was quite happy to take anything that came up, any opportunity I saw. Um, at that time, I wasn't particularly interested in getting married, so I was uh, able to take all the jobs that the married guys didn't want to take. Um, and that, that's really what it was. And I have to say the lack of formal education, because I didn't have a formal degree, it did hold me back for a while, which is why I actually took all the jobs that I saw coming up, because uh, I thought, well, I'm going to have to build this with experience. And, um, you know, it was to the point where now when I speak to my friends, who have got PhDs. And I said, well, despite that, I'll still give you a job. So it's uh, one of those. I love that. I love yeah. that. No, because you, all your various roles took you all over the world, Middle East, Scandinavia and elsewhere. So you, 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 you're building this absolute massive CV you know, which makes you the, the, the incredible person that you are now and, and, and sought after. Now, I want to talk about some of that because obviously you're seeing all these different cultures, but all these different mindsets regarding um, leaders and CEOs and business leaders. So in your eyes and your experience, Tim, what makes a good CEO slash leader? I don't think it's a magic formula. What I, what I did start to see culturally, I, was, I always were drawn towards the Scandinavian model of business how they did business i was impressed at the fact that the the managing director would get sandwiches down on a, on a friday morning and everyone would sit around and he would talk in casual terms to all the workers about the business about what they were putting up with what they're having to do and very honest about things as well and it was i think it was the honesty and transparency that actually struck me i um you know as i started to move up through the exxon ladder and went to other corporations the downside of the American model is it does breed politics, really, really bad politics inside organizations. And there were a couple of times, and it was, it was a revelatory experience to me, to actually come across people in departments or who headed up departments whose own personal gain was more important than the companies. That they were making decisions based on, you know, uh, thiefdoms, uh, perceived slights. And I, and I, I, I was staggered. I didn't think those kind of things actually happened. And I saw it more and more inside American and, and quite a few UK companies and, and European, but I never saw it in the Scandinavian companies. I just saw a sort of open form of management that I greatly admired. I mean, it's not, it's not without its flaws because sometimes you just wish they would make a flipping decision. But um, on the whole, that was, the, that was, you know, I always just thought to myself, if I'm ever in a position where I'm, I'm managing people and managing teams or managing a business, it's these people I'd like to uh, I like to see, and and in latter life I got to I got to meet people like um, Hans Rousing, the uh, Tetra Pak um, owner. Well, he sold his shares back in ninety, but he was it was quite inspirational the way he thought about his business. There, there's an element of ruthlessness there. Don't get me wrong. I mean every every top um, professional has to have an element of ruthlessness, but also an element of humanity uh, and acceptance. And without fail, all of them um, have put their, put their workers front and center of their business. To them, it was all about the people. And, and people say this, but don't genuinely mean it. But I actually saw it happening. And 
you know, people would say to me, you know, you need to have people in your business who are cleverer than you, you know, who know more than you, because if, if, if you're, if you're it, then the, the company's in trouble. And that's always been my mantra. And I was never bothered by the fact that people could be, you know, come up to better decisions than me. So long as I understood, you know, so long as no one was, so long as no one cared who took the credit, then anything could happen. That was how I felt about it. Yeah, and you, obviously we're going to, we're, what takes me seamlessly to my next question, really, with regards to taking ABD dynamics um, from private to IPO to yes. a, a major sized company with global contracts all over the place with OEMs. Um, so you actually use that model. So tell me about that transition from private, IPO, floating, and then whoosh. You know, because you were, right. you know, it was a small company. What size was it when you took over? It was about a uh, four or five million turnover. Wow. Um, it was quite profitable. Uh, it was, it was incredibly well run as a small business. So Tony Best, who, who basically was the major shareholder, he was coming up to the age of 75 and really wanted to move the company on. And he couldn't persuade his existing directors to do the management buyout that he felt the company was worth. And in truth, they were they were good engineers um, and they were quite happy to let Tony run the business and, and, do, and they just want to get their heads down and do stuff they enjoyed. Which is a good thing and a bad thing, because obviously you have to be sensitive to those people's feelings when you come into a company from the outside. Now, prior to that, I had been involved in a NASDAQ company and I had seen how you can get it catastrophically wrong. Um, you know, I've seen the egos in play. I've seen, uh, I've seen the brokers and advisors running the show. Um, I'd seen all things and I thought, yeah, this is a, really a template of how not to do it. And I got involved in another couple of uh, sort of um, IPOs that went fairly smoothly. But I was a bit skeptical that AIM was going to be the right vehicle for AB Dynamics. I was not at all sure. So I got my feet under the table and there was an immediate things we had to be sorted. But on the whole, it was a, it was a well-run company. Um, the first thing I noticed was their facilities were awful. You know, it was it almost put me off for uh, joining them. I just thought this is such a typical thing that you see in the UK. You know, excellent engineering businesses run out of sheds. Whereas, you know, to go to Germany, and Scandinavia. Lots of businesses have started in sheds and garages, though, Tim. Come on, to be fair. They have. They shouldn't have, they shouldn't have to stay there. And that was my, all they, <laughs> all they were doing was building bigger sheds. And I just thought Very the company, company deserves better than that. And it also needed a bit of a radical overhaul on its management. And I thought an IPO and a listing would actually make this company investment ready, but also give us the opportunity to get the company, you know, root and branch audited. Because people don't realize that when you do go down the route of, um, of an IPO, you've got legal audit and a financial audit companies that come in and they go through your systems and they look at you. And they, then, or the nomad, will only determine you're ready for listing if they give you the full, you know, clean bill of health. So they'll look at the systems, they'll look at the management system, they'll look at the orders, they'll look at how the things are set up, they look at the health and safety. Everything is gone through, all the legal contracts, the validity of the, pat of the patents. And it's a great opportunity to sit down, you know, and, and, you know, the existing directors can't argue with the information they see in front of them. You say, look, guys, I think an IPO is right for us. You own shares in the business. Your shares are worth nothing because you're a private company. The only one's going to buy them is other people inside the company. This is an opportunity to raise a bit of money, restructure the company and, and move on. Yeah, they said, but the city is a bit of a la-la land. And I said, well, let me deal with that. You handle the company a bit. Come and support me when you can, but I'll get the company you know, investment ready. And I said, but are you risking everything? I said, no, I don't think we're risking everything. But what we did find back in 2013 is that we were only second company in the UK to go into onto IPO. A lot of IPOs have been pulled uh, in March and April because all following the, the credit crunch. And um, it was not an easy experience, actually. But the trick really was, in my opinion, was to keep the nomad and the broker separate. You know, they, they talk about Chinese walls. Maybe it's got better. But there were times where I needed the nomad on our side when we had issues with the broker and vice versa. And, you know, build the picture, tell the story, 
and select the investors that understand your story. And whatever you do, don't switch the story to suit the investor. And I saw, I've seen that a few times. You know, still doing, said, well, still happening. yeah, yeah, yeah. We're looking for more IP related. Oh, well, you want IP? Here's my other presentation about IP. You know, if, if the person who wants to invest, they see hundreds of people a week. And if, you, if you're not fitting their current model or their current thinking, there's no point trying to force fit it in there because in two years time, you'll have a huge problem when you try, try and get them out of it or they dump your stock one day without, without asking. So, um, you know, you've got to get, um, you got to get real uh, into the sense that what happens on the week of the actual IPO is, is incredibly stressful because the broker doesn't tell you really what's going on. He doesn't tell you how, how his book building is going. Um, he, he has to sort of uh, speak to other people who he's talking to. And they'll say, well, OK, we're going to go to market. This is the share price. If you want to buy a million, it's this. If you want to buy two million, it's that. And then the other guy's got to work out on the other side is, OK, has he really got a book that's built or do I uh, low, low ball it? And at the end of the day, what they're trying to do is get an oversubscribed offer. And the other important thing I thought, and we got a quite sort of keen advice on this one, is that don't overprice your company. Whatever you do, it doesn't, it doesn't really matter. You don't have to raise the money on the first uh, on the first float, you know, and whatever you do, don't dump all the founder stock. You know, it's, it, it, there's a requirement to create stock for liquidity and there's a requirement to perhaps create new stock because you want to be able to get that EIS qualifying and VCT qualifying. And you also want to be able to use that money to grow the business. To have a clear story about what the money's used for. You know, but I've, I got involved recently with a company and nearly all the money that they were trying to raise was actually for the founder stock. There was no new money. And I, I said, well, I don't, I don't understand what's in that for anyone. They said, yeah, but we think it's a bad idea to be out there raising money. I said, no, it's a good idea because they want to know what you're going to do with the money. That's all they're asking. If I was to give you a million, what would you do with it? If I gave you 10 million, would you know what to do with it? And these are the kind of questions that the, um, that the investors would ask or the fund managers would ask. So on the day, um, it actually went quite well. Um, we all sat there uh, around the balcony in the stock exchange, watched our stock price come up on the market. And to our utter relief, it went upwards. <laughs> brilliant, brilliant. Now, I've got, I've got to ask you this question because obviously lots of, we've seen lots of IPOs recently, you know, 2020, 2021, 2022, uh, less so 2022 thus far, year to date. And lots of them have absolutely gone out, out the blocks, um, gone up 100, 100%, 200%, 300%. And now we've seen them all in the last six months just roll right over, especially the ones that are tech related on the NASDAQ and elsewhere all coming down to earth. Now, for me, some of them were grossly overpriced in the first place. Some of them were just marketed to the yin yang so that everybody thought this was gonna to go to the moon and now it's all come back. Why do nomads, brokers and so on and so forth want to get, A, get it oversubscribed, you know, to make them look good obviously, but have it so grossly overvalued in the first place so that there's no, there's no buyers left. So the only place to come down is, is sellers selling into the, into the price. Well, I don't, I don't know the 100% reason why that happens. I do know that you use the word nomad broker. The nomad is not interested in the share value to a certain extent. He might advise you on what the share value should be. I mean, you, you yourself will have valuations on the business. Uh, the analyst might turn around and say, well, companies in your particular area are 22 PE or 18 PE. You know, this is where you need to be. Um, if you classify yourself as a technology company, you're over here. If you classify yourself as an engineering company, you're down there. So maybe you're somewhere in between. It was quite imprecise. I mean, someone took all of our previous uh, valuations, you know, net present value, discounted cash flow. There was there were seven valuations done in the business, added them all up and divided them by seven. And that's how we came to the price of the business. Um, wow. I know. And I, but the nomad said to me, I think, uh, Tim, at, at best, it's going to be 16 times earnings. Just work on that as a value. And um, we actually thought that was a bit expensive. And um, because, you know, the, the long term plan is what the broker made, made us sort of think. He said, first, get yourself onto the market and hit that first year number. 
you know, if the analyst said you're going to do 11 million, do 11 million. If you're going to do, if you're going to do more, let us know and break through that. And that was the key thing, really, was to, you know, we were only six months from when we listed. We were only had six months to then publish our year end numbers, and our year end numbers were spot on. Then our half year numbers were ahead of forecast, and then our second year. That, that's how you manage it. And because it was an, an, a, an, not a very sexy company, it it grew gradually. There were there. The only time it had a bit of a run was when they decided to allow AIM stock to be allowed in pension pots. I can't remember when that was. I think it was 2014-15. Suddenly there was this massive yeah, shortage time, of AIM yeah. stock or, or decent mm -hmm. AIM stock and a share just ran away with itself and we were actually about concerned about that. Um, but the good news was it, it stayed at that plateau for a year and then started going back up again when we started delivering results. So I don't really know. There's There's... There are a lot of companies that go to AIM for the wrong reason, in my opinion. Just because you've got a good, say if you're, say if you're a plumbing company and you've got a great set of plumbers and, and, and your business is really good, that's not a listable company. You know, that, that's a company that's a good company. That's all it is. But if it suddenly developed a, a heat pump that could be used around the world and it needs, you know, scaling, that's, a, that's an investable proposition. You know, at the end of the day, all these things have got to be not just obviously scalable, but have a have a route that is scalable, that an understandable route that follows, and that one you don't deviate from too much. There's nothing wrong with turning around and saying actually the way we're going is slightly wrong. We're going to pivot slightly, um, but again, I don't think you should use the word pivot. But there's nothing wrong with just reviewing your plan. Your your annual reports should be as boring as hell. They should say the same thing every year. You know that's what we just get complained about. Oh, this is the same you said last year. And I said, yeah, guess what. <laughs> It is. That's what we do. Uh, we design and we build systems to make cars safer. And uh, this year we sold more systems that make cars safer, safer than last year. And we're going to continue to do that. I'm going to diversify our product portfolio. But we're not going to suddenly going to become something else. We're not going to go into flying taxis or or, um, you know, rockets. That's where we are. That's what we do. We know our knitting. And again, that to me was always the Scandinavian and the German thing. You know, if you if you have ever stopped at a town in Germany, there'll be an industrial estate with a company that's number one somewhere in the world in what it does. And that's what I always liked. And that's what I liked about the West Country. There are lots of little businesses in these, uh, these uh, industrial estates like Avon and, uh, you know, uh, was it um, Latchways? You know, these are, these are niche businesses that did really well. And, uh, you know, they've listed and they've done, had mixed fortunes. But the point is that, that they were, they dominated their niche and they knew what, who they were. Sorry, I'm rambling a mm. bit now. No, no, that's absolutely fine. Uh, I, I wanted to touch on what makes a good company. This is, I mean, you've touched on it there with regards to, you know, they, they've had their uh, fluctuations regarding Avon's had a bit of bad luck of, of late and Latchways and others and Allstead and all the rest of it have done well. Small companies that have grown steadily. You know, um, so I want you to talk about that regarding, you know, we've got lots of different lifted, listed entities on AIM and on the FTSE. Some of them started off quite small and quite niche, but have grown steadily. Others have come through out of the blocks and gone whoosh and haven't, you know, they've been overvalued to start with and carried on being undervalued. And then the reality has come down to earth. You grew ABD Dynamics steadily, stealthily, smart, shrewdly. Yeah. And it wasn't a load of acquisitions. It was by growth of revenues and growing into new markets. Now, why do so many companies want to run before they've learned how to walk, Tim? Well, I think a lot of these companies, I mean, if I'm, I could be wrong here, but a lot of these companies go whoosh out the block. Are they pre-profit? Often they're not, yes. Especially yeah. in the US. <laughs> Well, Unicorns, this, this, is the, mate. this is this is this is the thing you see. Um, I uh, this is the lesson I learned from a Nasdaq business I was working in. In the UK, I decided to establish a, a group to to supply the London Low Emission Zone with all the emission control technology, and uh, we use all our IP from America and we set up a, a, a workshop, and the ch and and we started to actually make a good business and make money, but the uh, chairman was very concerned. He said, the point is that as soon as you start to make revenue, people can put a value on you. If you're delivering a promise, um, then the value can be anywhere. 
and that's that was that was his words and I was actually quite shocked and um and actually when I sort of showed him the bank balance uh, at the end of uh, three months of trading I said look look we've, we're making money he sort of nodded and looked at me and said so we're a product company are we I said, well, no, but wow. we're, we're... Right. That, 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 that takes me to my next question, right? We've got this situation, right, where everything's almost geared to um, city regulators and institutional investors. Do institutions, CEOs and listed companies underestimate the value of good and authentic communication with retail private investors? Um... I think it gets a, a lot of it depends on size, doesn't it? I mean, you've you've got those companies that all they do is rely on private investor sentiment, the um, the, the 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 sort of small cap investment companies having let dropped them years ago. Um, and I've always been a bit concerned about the cult of the celebrity CEO, the the person who you know, I, I had some situations recently where. I was doing some work for a couple of fund managers and some private equity. And I was a bit surprised by the sort of level of naive, naivety of some of the stuff they're looking at. You know, I was saying that, you know, some of this stuff is based on the flimsiest pretext. It doesn't really seem to be doing anything. I said, who, wh wh why are we doing this? I said, oh, well, you know, Charlie Thrustworth, at, at, uh, you know, Crapston Funding, he's done it. And I think it's always the same names. You know, it's always the same names that bring these for or, or working behind it. And, you know, when the, I mean, there was a company that came onto the market uh, about five years ago called Intelligent Energy. And they came on the market and they raised a huge amount of money. And they were so big, they actually went, I think they were actually qualified for 250 company. And they, they, their, their mission was to bring fuel cells into the market. And I actually knew people who, who were working with them and they burned brightly for three years and then fizzled out i mean who who, who would have, who's going to back that and then i see that the uh the, you know, a lot of the same sort of team are, are back out there again um you know it, it's a scandal it's a scandal um i mean there was no accountability for that some people lost a lot of money well i can only see they must have lost a lot of money because it you know it 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 positioned itself as a as a viable running company pre-profit and uh, was predicated on a technology that's still, I think, seven years away. You know, we still haven't resolved the hydrogen supply. Um, we haven't got down to the cost of the, the precious metal. Um, you know, these, these fuel cells use huge amounts of platinum group metals. Where's that going to come from? It, it just seems that people just don't, I don't know, they just get blind, blinded by it. They get caught up in this rush and, and they can't stop themselves. And I think this is what happens when if you communicate to the private investor, I mean, my experience with the private investors was 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 good. I, I enjoyed it, but they were the most difficult bunch of people to satisfy. And uh, you know, because a lot of these private investors, that's what they do. People like yourself, Peter, you you sit and analyze the numbers. You know, I, I've always said I'll let you into a secret. A lot of CEOs uh, are not good with numbers. You. Because actually, you don't want them to be good with numbers. You want them to be managing the staff and the and the building and the structures and stuff. You want them to have a good CFO who can answer those questions. Uh, but I do remember being in a meeting once, and uh, someone was leafing through our annual report and came up with a question. And mistakenly, I hadn't brought my CFO with me that day. And he said, "You know, I'm, I'm interested of the ratio of cost to this against this, and and the percentage of that against X." And I sort of flicked through the annual report and I looked at my broker who's looked at his feet and I said well I'm really sorry actually I'll, I'll get back to you on that if I if you catch me afterwards I'll, I'll talk about it and then later on I caught him in uh, in the bar you know talking to his friends he said I wouldn't invest in a company whose CEO doesn't understand the number and I thought oh, I feel really bad about that you know because I knew the business was good but I was unable to convey it and so it gave me a uh, it, it made me understand that the way that you approach the private investors, the information you give to the private investor is sl slightly different to the one you might give the fund managers. I mean, fund managers will, will see you at the half year. They'll see you at the end of the year. And if you have an investor day, you might be able to invite them down and, and let them play with your machinery. But they don't actually spend much time looking at your numbers. You know, there's not much an analysis going on. But collectively, inside the, inside the private investors, there's hundreds of man hours of investigation. 
And uh, if you're unfortunate enough to be getting onto the message boards, it it just it just goes it goes it goes mad. I mean, I was always uh, being ber berated by our options policy. You know, I said we can't afford to pay the kind of money that big companies can to get the good engineers. But what we can do is share the company's fortunes. So we'll have good bonus systems based on profit and we'll have options for all staff so that everyone can enjoy it. But unfortunately, options have to be costed. And, and then you start running into these horrible things called adjusted numbers, which I hate. You know, you, you show your adjusted profit. Even if, even if you can justify that it wasn't part of the cash generation of the business, it still doesn't look good. It still doesn't look good. And that's another thing that private investors jump onto very quickly. So I know CEOs who simply won't engage with private investors because they've been scorched uh, and, they, and they really don't want to be, you know, they, they treat them a bit like a spider in the corner. It's fine if they're just standing there doing nothing, start moving towards you, they start freaking out. And I think that's, that's the issue. You, 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 you can get quite a hostile reception uh, with, a, with a private investor. Having said that, I think it's a private investor that drives the prices. Um, especially when you've got uh, fairly illiquid stock in AIM, where you've got 500, 300 stocks going through. It's all private investor stuff. And I think that the fund managers take advantage of that. And I think I've seen fund managers dropping stock into the, into the retail market for retailers to pick up. And that's not what they should be doing. You know, large bits of stock should be placed by the broker. They should be managed. The overhang, that's what the broker's there to do, manage the overhang. So if he's just dropping stock into the um, into the retail market, I think he's well. I don't think he's right personally. It's one of my bugbears. Well, it takes it takes me on to the, the next point here about the introduction of the market abuse regulations, MAR in 2016, and then the people discharging management responsibilities, the PDMRs, which was introduced. But we still see RNSs ordinarily. They're meant to come out. You know, they've they've got weeks, months to organise these scheduled. RNSs, and then they're embargoed, of course, right? Um, so ordinarily, they should come out at 7, 7 a.m. with everybody else. We still see these RNSs coming out and these quite sensitive data coming out at, after the market has shut, you know, five o'clock, half past six, you're going, what? You've got a placing. Last month, the RNS was saying, financial-wise, we're, we're sound, we don't need any money. Now we're doing a raising, capital raising. The CFO has just gone. Why haven't you shared this information with us before? You know, yeah. what's why is this irregularity going on so frequently, Tim? I think it's I think it's uh, imperfectly applied. I remember when the market abuse regulation first came out. Our our legal company, you know, um, the, the, our legal advisors, and the broker and the nomad all provided the interpretation of how this should be applied. And uh, the legal people actually turned around and said, forget the other ones, this is the one you should be looking at. But we had to demonstrate to the nomad satisfaction that we had a procedure in place, okay? Not a procedure in place that suited us, but a procedure in place that met the spirit of the market abuse regulation. So you had to show that you had a, um, a, a method for disposing of stock so that the, you know, the, the individual it would be determined if it was on a list of PDMRs. And the thing is, Here's the thing. In, in a small company, most people are PDMRs. Most people are party to information. You know, when, when you see people selling stock before the close period, they know what the monthly results are because everyone knows what they are. You've only got to go on to Sage or whatever um, system you're using and push the button. It'll say, right, you're behind or you're above. Um, the order's going out. You know, if you see the guys working in dispatch, working their nuts off, you realize that you're having a good year. So it's, it's very difficult. It, again, it's another my bugbear as well, is, is seeing people selling before the close period, then going into the close period, say, well, it's OK, it's all, it's all good. So um, I think it's, it's imperfectly applied. And I said my own example was that, you know, three agencies came up with three interpretations of how the market abuse regulation should be applied. Um, but actually, it was, the, it was the legal advisors who trumped it and said, well, this is one that we want. But the nomad turned around and said, that's fine, but I've got, I'm the one who's got to approve it. Um, and here's the problem. There is, although there are the rules inside of uh, AIM, you know, there's the, there's a, uh, but there's, 
you know you go onto people's websites and it, it says what you know your corporate social responsibility your your you know the what they call the aim 28 rule most of them say we we follow the standards of the was it the quoted companies qca you know it's not like there's a an fca thing you do you say we follow the this this is what we follow um and i, and I never have got around to prescribing an actual method you know it's, it's rather like um you know prove yourself innocent if you found if if, if they come in looking for you and this is why the nomad is so important the nomad is key you know he should be involved in all of the rns decisions everything should be passed to him because ultimately he's the one who represents you with the um with the stock market with the stock exchange um yeah. so and unfortunately i think the quality of uh, nomads you know there's still some good ones out there but i don't think it's improved um okay so let me ask let me ask you this then and, and from your own experience um whilst you're at abd dynamics specifically and, and nasdaq companies when when you and and your colleagues were buying shares authentically buying shares and thinking you know what i'm feeling you know that it's worth my while irrespective of options i'm going to go into the market and buy some stock because i value my company and we see that as an, as private investors we see that and we think oh crikey the ceo the cfo are buying so we all ordinarily see that as a really good sign to join in. Yeah, no, I think that is. Um, but I don't think the converse is true. You know, if you see a CEO and a, and a, and a director selling, it doesn't mean to say that he thinks it's all going to peak tong. And the thing is that um, if, 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 the, uh, if the person wants to buy a Ferrari, the options don't buy the Ferrari. It's the, um, it's the, it's the selling of the options to get the Ferrari. If he wants to put his kids through school, if he's sitting there, suddenly he realizes he's got about half a million pounds worth of uh, shares um, that are worth something, um, and yet he's only got a salary of 70, 80,000 pounds coming in after bonuses, then he'll want to access it. And it's always been my thing is that, you know, the, the, the only way that small companies can attract the talent uh, and pay them is to actually make them part of the program. If you're going to give them options and the company starts doing well, you shouldn't be surprised if they start to sell because that's what they're you know that that's that's what it was given to them for you can't say well actually here's the money but you can't use it well you know they'll, they'll go they'll, they'll leave um but i think uh, if you saw if you see directors and people buying shares in aim companies or their own or their own company that's definitely a good sign definitely a good sign because i can't think any reason why they wouldn't i mean i remember buying some stock for maybe dynamics uh, initially, because I saw the shop stock price fall, and I thought, "Wow, stupid! I can, uh, you know, that, that's ridiculous. I'll, I'll have some of that." And I think Tony, who'd been trying to get rid of his stock at the time, he went in and bought some as well. And now, actually, it had no real effect um, on the stock price, strangely enough, except there were comments on 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 some notice boards saying, "If you've got hundreds of thousands of stock, why would you buy a hundred more? I don't get it." And uh, I thought, "Well, that's true. That's true." Um, so, but um, no, I, 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 wanted, think, I, wanted, I want to change things up slightly now. And we're talking about you buying some stocks. Obviously, you've still got some investments out there other than your, your bikes and your cars. And I want to talk about stocks per se or funds. What's your yeah. style? And, you know, given your experience, you're able to analyze and look at look at um, the RNSs and the accounts out there. And you're choosing certain funds and stocks. What's your style and how do you filter down to the what you're going? That's going to have some Rogers money backing there. I'm going to buy some okay. of that. Um, I, I think I've come across it before with you, but I actually, during my time going around the city and meeting up with fund managers, there were a few ones that I thought, yeah, if I ever had money, this is who I put my money with. And um, you would think, yeah, you know, you would think that if you if you've been a you know um, a manager of a large company or medium sized company, you would you would see how good companies could be. And I used to go along to some of the share stock meetings and see these CEOs and uh, really, really buy into it. You know, God, this guy's mustard, isn't he? He's great. And um, the company would be nothing, you know, wouldn't do anything. So I actually realized that I wasn't very good at, at spotting them in, in the same way that, you know, quite often a, a salesman is not a good buyer or a buyer is not a good salesman. Um, it's, I, I haven't come, I mean, I was speaking to some other sort of former CEOs recently and they said the same thing. They've, They've entrusted most of their stock funds with fund managers that they they trust. 
Um, a bit of guidance here and there. I mean, I, I have, I do invest in in, in companies myself, um, but I actually, I put most of my money into Scandinavia. Um, I just felt that's probably, you know, my 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 interpretation of where things like clean energy and and clean air and clean water, a lot of the fundamental stuff's been done in Denmark and Sweden, and that's that's an area that I understand. So I, if I'm going to invest myself, I'll invest in businesses that I understand and the, and the businesses I understand. If I'm going to divest in things and work in Amazon and financial stocks and fintech, I'll give that to a, a, a broker or a fund manager. So I'd say a good 80% of my investable stock is with managed funds, companies that I companies that I came across and thought, yeah, you know, I would entrust my money with them. To be honest, they don't know, they don't do very I mean, none of them have done well in the last six months, well, except for one, but most of them have all followed the trend down and None of them have beaten the the, the trackers uh, that are out there. So even the best managers, I mean, I discovered that the fund manager that is able to do well in the rising market is not the same fund manager who does well in the falling market. And for that reason, I might just uh, change my portfolio around uh, to reflect that. Um, whether that's to do with defensive stocks, you probably know more than me, Peter, but um, certainly my own sort of basic analysis the other thing is, well, is moving out of uh, stock. You know, there's uh, there's the idea of just you know keeping your physical cash and other things. Um, my wife and I have a nice property portfolio which we've been building up. Um, we uh, we graft on the stuff ourselves sometimes, or we spend a lot of time waiting in for tradesmen to turn up. But it's been quite rewarding. And I and I do remember when I was uh, when I, after I left AB Dynamics in uh, 2018, a fund manager saying. Oh, so you bought the house, blah blah blah, and you think you're going to be able to do beat my beat my fund? And I said, well, I don't want to put it all into one basket, but yes, I, I, I like to do that. And of course, it has. The house prices has exceeded his fund, and the rental income has been really good. Um, and you mentioned classic cars. I've always made great losses at, at classic cars. <laughs> well, you um, enjoyed the ride. <laughs> yeah, but I mean, more more recently, I've picked a couple that actually have made good money. So. Um, yeah, I think it's a it's important to keep a mixed portfolio. You know, physical gold, a um, bit of art, um, stuff that you know, stuff that you know and enjoy. I mean, it's much more enjoyable collecting cars, bikes, arts, antiques, watches, than it is investing in stock. I think. Um, yeah. I, I completely agree to have the diversity. But you touched on a really and several points you made there. But I wanted to go back to one, if I may. The importance of having access to cash and the flexibility that gives. So many people underestimate that. And I see that across Twitter and across social media. I'm all in, I'm all in, I'm fully invested. I'm going, hmm. So what happens if the markets decline slightly or another stock, one of your stocks declines significantly? What are you going to do? You're just going to wait for it to rebound? You've got no cash to invest. No, I agree. I mean, it's uh, um, I'm the worst at this, but uh, you know, years of personal experience tells me that you must have cash. You know, in fact, you know, it was almost like you should build your reserve of cash before you even think about investing. Um, and it's the same with companies as well. You know, uh, the ones that seem to be the most robust are the ones that actually run a good cash balance that are lightly geared. I mean, you can be heavily geared. You can grow really quickly. But of course, when it turns against you, uh, you've got nowhere to go. Um, the, the other thing I always look at is, is when people heavily emphasize their intangible assets on their balance sheet. You know, that, again, um, I went in once and saw uh, an analyst just put a line through it. I said, what does that mean? Because I don't even look at intangible. Ad. All I'm looking at is your asset. I said, what about the patent portfolio? What about that? And he goes, well, if you can monetize it, good for you. He said, I'll come back in five years time. And if I see that your cash flow has gone up, then I know you monetized it. And I thought that's that's quite interesting. But yeah, no, it's 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 harder. To, it's, you know, when things start to fall, it's very hard to get your cash out, isn't it? Yeah, it's absolutely, almost impossible. Absolutely. Now, Very you, expensive. Absolutely. Now, you've touched on um, IP patents and intangibles in this conversation. I wanted to wrap up a little bit because you're involved in all of that space all, all over the world. Um, so I wanted to ask this question. Given all the talk about nanotechnology, graphene, hydrogen, renewables, all this talk about all this money is going to go into ESG, you're looking at all these different technologies all over the world. 
Yeah. If if there is one, two or three technologies at the moment, you think actually these technologies in two, three years time, investors need to be looking into this space now. Because I think the best investors are the ones that look at future tech, not what's there right now going like that on that hype cycle, but early on investors do best. What okay. ideas are you seeing, Scandinavia or elsewhere in the world well, that you're thinking? Water, clean to, tech. I do advise advisory staff occasionally for big family offices. You know, these are the ones that have generated fortunes many, many years ago. And they are long, slow investors. And their money is going in food, clean air, clean water. So they are buying up tracts of land all around the world. They are investing in technology for clean water, for clean air. The, the problem with all of these things is that we, we get... At the moment, we're back onto carbon emissions. It's all about carbon dioxide, carbon emissions, greenhouse gases. Um, two years ago, we were concerned that the air quality in London was appalling. So it, it was all about NO2, NO, NOx, PM, the, the ultra low emission zone. It's nothing to do with global warming. It's, it's all to do with clean air. And there is a dichotomy there. And we keep coming across this, that people, politicians sometimes don't understand the difference between carbon and carbon dioxide. They think smoke is carbon, carbon is smoke. And you get a very disjointed thinking. Now, the, the automobile industry and the regulatory industries, you know, have 15 years to work on these programs. They can't switch it back and forwards just because politics tells them to do that. At the moment, we're very much glued up to renewables. And the issue about renewables has been energy storage. I happen to think that hydrogen is a route. I think it is actually a very, very key route that can be done. And what's Interesting me is the mega billions that are now going into hydrogen and green hydrogen production. The other thing about hydrogen is that you can use hydrogen in existing engines. And I've been working with companies that are looking to um, be able to use the existing heavy duty internal combustion engines, but actually use hydrogen instead. So locomotives on the rail, uh, large trucks, JCB and Banford have a huge program running on looking at internal combustion engines running on hydrogen. and you know, the, the issue people is that people drive on electric cars um, feeling very smug about things, because all, but all they've done is if your energy is coming from a fossil fuel, you've just transferred the problem. If we start getting joined up energy policy, there will be a massive move toward hydrogen. Um, and that, that's an area that I think is, is quite key. The second thing I think is robotics. Um, you know, the actual introduction of automation and robotics and things on the day to day has actually been quite slow. Um, and there have been a couple of companies I've been looking at in the Southwest that are unlocking the ability of normal organizations to be able to accelerate their robotics programs. Um, the, the, ship, the chip shortage has caused a big problem here because a lot of these things are heavily reliant on, on in, you know, chips and, and technology. But, you know, the, the implementation of Fairly conventional technology. None of this stuff is new, by the way. I mean, hydrogen has been around for ages uh, as, a, as a fuel concept. I remember BMW having a program back in the late 80s. Uh, they, they realized they didn't have a fuel cell program like their friends Mercedes did. So they came up with this internal combustion engine that could run on hydrogen. The issue is, and there are always issues, is that if you put hydrogen in the cryogenic tank, after about four or five days, it all leaks away. So that's a problem to solve. If you've got wind farms that are generating huge amounts of energy during the day, in theory, you can convert that into hydrogen using electrolyzers. This is all stuff that people know about. Um, but I think there are genuine solutions coming up now to those, um, those issues. So, you know, on the renewable side, um, who would you invest in? You know, the wind farm companies don't seem to make money. Investors and Siemens and General Electric all seem to be struggling. And, and any industry that relies on government initiatives or government grants, oh God, forget it, forget it. You'll be waiting forever. And, and at the other end of the scale, right at the bottom end of the scale, all those little companies that are getting um, launch money and uh, innovate money and, and survive on this, on this, you know, there, there has to be a time when you move away from that sort of crutch and become a self-standing company. You know, there are businesses in the UK and in Europe who have, who have people and individuals that all they do is scour for the grants. That's all they do. Now, one job is to look for the next grant. And, um, you know, it's, it's counterproductive. It makes, you, it makes you dependent and needy. 
likewise with these EIS thresholds, you know, there should be a time when you move away from that. You don't need it anymore. You can embrace it because you become a mature company. But all the time, these entrepreneurs want to raise the EIS threshold. And I think that's wrong. Okay, mm. I've gone on the round again. several good points out. I will ask another cheeky question now. You're highly sought after. You're working with all, all these SMEs. You're a NED with several companies. Is there a chance that within the next 18 months or so, two years, we're going to see Tim Rogers back with a listed company in the US or the UK? Um, no, because I think I found something that works for me. I mean, I, I have to say, um, I turned 60 last week. I know, Pete, it's amazing. I, Congrats, I missed that. I will, I will send you something in the post. I should say last week. I think it was last last month. They are. That's what age does to you. The thing about it is that that... Um, that stint I had with the NASDAQ company was really tiring. And I was in my late 40s, early 50s. The second stint I did with, um, with, the, you know, with AB Dynamics for six years wore me out. The thing about, the thing about small businesses, and I, I used to laugh at this, we used to go to the uh, city, you know, and uh, we're doing the fundraise and we, we were taken out for meals and we come back to the, the, the factory in West, you know, back in uh, Bradford and Avon. My PA was standing there. She goes, Tim, the ladies' toilets are blocked. <laughs> and I was thinking, oh, bollocks. Um, oh, dear. Um, and I think I bet Elon Musk doesn't have to do this stuff. You have to do everything. Mm -hmm. Basically, if you, if, you, if you see a problem, you've either got to put your own physical person into that problem uh which says okay let's work late night and get these packages out or you know some guy comes in and goes he doesn't he's he's doesn't like me he said rude things to me bring him in and talk to them you are doing all those things as you build the structures around you and i don't ever think you should leave that but you know running a mid-size sme for uh for a manager who, who cares about his people is exhausting and there are Loads of people happy to give you their advice on how you should be doing it, uh, but not how many people are prepared to step in and actually do it. And so, um, and, and it, go, it goes back, you've touched on there as well, um, the likes of Jeff, Jeff Bezos when he started, he, was, he started in books, just books, selling books online. He was packing those books himself. Now, hmm. that's one of the largest businesses in the world. So it's about, you, you are absolutely spot on about mucking in and, and doing as much as you can to support the business when, it, when it's that small and not being, you know, no, and I, and I, and I think uh, I don't think I want to do that again. Uh, I'm going to say no, never, never enough, say never. Um, it wasn't enough. like it wasn't like when I I I, uh, I stopped working for AB Dynamics. I got loads of offers, but I got offers, and um, I I really thought it was just time to oh god I hate to say to sort of stop and smell the roses, but just to ease back and think about it. And there were health issues. I had. Um, you know, obviously I had ignored those things and I thought I'd get myself back into, I mean, the, the thing that I think is most interesting is uh, the question that you asked is, do you think you're going to start working for someone else? And it's a question my wife asked me the other day. <laughs> and we know who's in charge, mate. We've all yeah, got bosses so I to think, answer to. I think I got a distinct feeling that, uh, you know, having me 24 seven is not really what she had in mind when I said I was gonna spend more time no, at home. No, fair enough. Now I'm, I'm gonna conclude that. We've got loads more we could talk about, but I'm gonna conclude it there, Tim. Uh, it's been absolutely wonderful to speak to you again. I'm looking forward to seeing you face to face at some point. Yeah. That was Tim Rogers, former CEO of AB Dynamics. Um, Please get in touch with him. You can find him on on the twi on Twitter as well and on LinkedIn. Um, my name is Peter Higgins. That was the um, Invest Investing Matters podcast. And thank you all again for listening. Thanks, Tim. And I look forward to seeing you again soon, sir. Thank you. Bye.